Hello and welcome back to Anton Math. Now we're going to look at a new type of polar graph here and as usual we're going to go ahead and graph it out first and then we'll give it a name afterwards. So let's take a look. Sketch r equals 1 plus 2 cosine theta. So as always first thing we want to do is we want to set up that reference graph. Let's go ahead and uh, draw out our axes. First let's note we have an amplitude of 2 and we have a vertical shift of 1. So when I set up my reference graph over here, I need to make sure I give myself enough space to go all the way up to 3 and all the way down to negative 1. We don't have any change of period, so we won't have any problems going from 0 to 2 pi with my theta. My r is going to go up to 3. And it's going to go down to negative 1. Go ahead and mark out our key points. And we're ready to graph. I have this new horizontal axis for my graph at 1 because of that vertical shift up of 1. So I'm capping out at 3 to begin with because we're dealing with cosine. I'll hit my horizontal axis at pi over 2. I'll bottom out at pi. I'll hit that horizontal axis at 3 pi over 2 and I'll peek out again at 2 pi. It's going to look a little something like this. Now something that's a little bit useful here, notice that I don't know what my points are here and here. I know when I'm crossing the new horizontal axis at 1, but it's helpful to know when I have r equals 0. Remember when r equals 0 in my polar graph, that's when we actually cross through the pole itself. So let's figure out when r equals 0. And the way we do that is we're just going to write r as 0 in our equation that we have. So let's say r is 0. When r is 0, we're looking at 0 equals 1 plus 2 cosine theta. So we need to solve for the thetas between 0 and 2 pi that are going to give us this r equals 0. Now remember we learned how to do this in chapter 7. This should be no problem to us. We go ahead and subtract 1 from both sides and divide by 2. We're going to get cosine of theta is equal to negative 1 half. And we know that cosine of theta equals negative 1 half in uh, the first period 0 to 2 pi. When I have theta is equal to 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. All right, these are my values in quadrants 2 and 3 where cosine is negative that have a reference number pi over 3 where cosine is 1 half. So this right here, this is 2 pi over 3 and over here we have 4 pi over 3. All right, this is just going to give us a little bit more information when we're drawing in polar coordinates. We know exactly when we're going to be passing through that pole. So let's go ahead and take a look at this graph. I'll graph out my polar axis first. Now I know I'm going to go all the way up to 3, so let's go ahead and mark that out. I have 1, 2, 3. Okay, another key value is going to be 1, and then of course 0. But first, let's go ahead and draw out some of our reference axes. So that we can go through these angles. Now we have our normal key angles, 0, pi, pi over 2, and 3, pi over 2, but I also want to know where 2, pi over 3 is, and I'm going to draw it in both positive and negative directions since I'm switching from positive to negative at 2, pi over 3, and I want to know where 4, pi over 3 is, and again I'm going to draw that in both positive and negative direction with respect to 4, pi over 3, because that's where we're going to be crossing at 0 again. And just for reference, let's go ahead and put some circles out here. Let's put out a reference circle with radius 1. And let's put out a reference circle with radius 3. Now I'm not just choosing 1 and 3 arbit arbitrarily. If we look over here, we notice uh, at pi over 2 I hit 1. At um, pi I hit negative 1, which is the same as 1, just in a different direction, and at 2 pi and at 0 I hit 3. 
I don't really hit to anywhere. I pass through to a couple of times, but it's not going to happen at any of these angles that I've marked out, is it? So let's go ahead and draw our graph. Now starting at uh, theta equals 0, my r is 3, so I'm going to start right here. When I get to theta equals pi over 2, I hit 1. So that's going to be right here. This is 1 pi over 2. I start out um, getting towards 1 very slowly and then speed up. So we're going to look a little something like this. My angle is changing. I'm getting closer to the origin, but not too fast. And as I get closer and closer and closer to pi over 2, I start getting closer to the origin very quickly. Okay. Now from pi over 2 to 2 pi over 3, I'm going from 1 to 0. So here's my pi over 2. And this is why we drew this pi, uh, 2 pi over 3 line, so that I know I'm going from 1 to 0 like this. By the time I get to the angle 2 pi over 3, I've hit 0. Now from 2 pi over 3 to pi, I'm going from 0 to negative 1. So even though I'm moving from 2 pi over 3 to pi, I'm in the negative direction, so I'm going to be drawing over here. I'm going from 0 to negative 1. Now we can keep drawing using my reference graph, but what if instead we use some of our symmetry tests? Notice I'm using cosine, and with cosine we always have our first symmetry test. That is, if I replace this theta with a negative theta, I get the exact same equation because cosine is even, so that means I'm symmetric over the polar axis. Whenever we're symmetric over the polar axis, as soon as I finish graphing 0 to pi, I just need to flip everything that I have and draw it again as a reflection over the polar axis, and we'll finish out our graph. So this little piece right here reflects over the polar axis and looks, oops, let me try that again, it looks like this. All right. Uh, this little piece right here reflects over the polar axis like so. And I continue my reflection over the polar axis for this long piece here that we drew first. Now there's nothing wrong with just continuing to use the reference graph and doing exactly what we just did by using the reference graph. That's absolutely fine. Um, but if you see the symmetry and you know how to use it, it can really cut down on uh, the amount of time this takes. Okay, let me take away these O's now. This is our graph. So it's kind of like a cardioid, but instead of coming to a point at the origin here, we actually go inside of what we've drawn already and we have another inner loop. Okay? Now let's take a, let's look at what this is called. Let's give this a name. We call this a limason. Now this is a French word. There's a little accent on this C. Um, and I took French a long, long time ago, but I believe that's called an accent circumflex. And this is called a limason. In French, this means snail. You see, it looks kind of like a snail's, <clears throat> snail's shell, doesn't it? But in general, a limason is going to occur any time we have the equations r equals a plus or minus b cosine theta, or r equals a plus or minus b sine theta. These are all limasons. Now, the case we just did, we had an a that was less than b, right? We just looked at 1 plus 2 cosine theta, and 1 played the role of a, 2 played the role of b, so our a was less than b. This was our inner loop. Now earlier, we had an a equal to b, didn't we? We had a 2 plus, I think it was 2 plus 2 sine theta. When a equals b, we're going to dimple in and we're going to touch the origin or pole exactly one time, and that's called a cardioid. Remember, it looks like a heart. And the last case is when my a is greater than b. When a is greater than b, we call this dimpled. So it looks just like a cardioid. It's mostly circular and then kind of dimples in at one point, but at that dimple it doesn't hit the pole, and in fact it doesn't pass through the pole anywhere. So the dimple's going to be somewhere further out. We'll see something like this in some of the uh, upcoming videos. Alright, so that's our limason. Now in the next video we're going to talk about our last type of polar graph. It's called the lemniscate. We'll see you there.